delighted to have you here. My name is John Hamry. Uh, I'm the president at CSIS, and uh, I'm very glad, to, actually, I'm very glad I have Sharon Squassoni here because she was the one that thought that we ought to be getting on the front end of this issue, and I'm glad that, uh, glad that she's organized it. Thank you, Sharon, and all of our colleagues who are, who are here today. Um, you know, talking about nuclear safety after Fukushima, I, let me just, I just want to start by saying that you know, there's kind of a popular sentiment that's growing that somehow our, our Japanese friends were incompetent to manage this crisis. I think that's completely wrong. I think they've been working very, very hard under most remarkable and difficult set of circumstances you can imagine. You have to understand this earthquake and this tsunami, you know, it, it has taken the lives of probably 30,000 Japanese. Uh, you know, when we had, you remember how we were bro brought to our knees with Katrina. That was 1,300 people. This is 30,000 people. This is a, just a remarkable, and all of that is a backdrop. That would stop everything in its tracks by itself, and then to have a crisis of, of this significance on top of it. So I, I, I know these people well, and they have been doing heroic work, and, and they are smart and capable people dealing with a very complicated problem. So the spirit of this, uh, this discussion today is to, for all of us to stop, let's take the, the dumb emotion out of this. Let's take the anger out of this. Let's take the paranoia out of this. Let's, let's take the fear out of this, and let's start having the intellectual discussion that we need to have as thoughtful people about the role of nuclear power and the way that we need to deal with this very complex uh, industry. Now, I, uh, we're going to, you know, you know, this is I, this is a little bit like how stock markets crash. You know, the first immediate sentiment is everybody get out of that. You know, so we're and so all of a sudden you have tumult, and it takes several days for the market to kind of recover its balance and people to start thinking coolly and rationally. We're in the front end of that right now. That's where we are. That's what the purpose is of this session: to start thinking, you know, calmly about what we're looking at, not just race to the exit and say, shut down everything we got. That's, that's been the sentiment we've seen in some countries, and frankly, they're hurting themselves. So the goal now is for us to be thinking together, to think thoughtfully about this issue, and we're going to do that today with two superb panels. And I do want to say a sincere thanks to uh, all of our colleagues for coming today and bringing their wisdom to what I know will be a very civil discussion. We're going to hear lots of points of view, and we should. That's, that's to be expected. But this is in the spirit of thoughtful reflection, not white panic. And I think we should also never uh, don't let a day go by without saying, how can we help our friends in Japan? Not just with Fukushima, but with the, with the great crisis that they've been enduring. We need to find ways to help this w remarkable people. And, uh, and I call on all of you to find a way in your own heart uh, to make that work. So let me turn to you, Sharon. You're going to get this started for real. Thank you all for coming, and I look forward to the session. Thank you, John, um, and thanks to all of you for um, coming today. I would uh, underscore Dr. Hamry's uh, points about the objective of today's session. It is uh, not to sift through the data of what we know and don't know um, about uh, Fukushima, because I'm sure everyone here in this audience has been glued to their television screen or their computer screen, but we want to look ahead at how nuclear safety in the United States and abroad might change in response to Fukushima. Um, of course, there are questions about how Fukushima will affect what we call the nuclear renaissance, new nuclear construction in the United States, um, but that's a topic for another day. I think it's still a little too early to be taking bets. Um, here in the United States, government officials, civil society, and elected officials are already thinking about the lessons learned from Fukushima for safety at U.S. nuclear power plants. Um, and I'm very happy to have our three experts on the uh, first panel who will offer a kind of big picture um, assessment. I hope I won't hear the word Taurus in. <laughs> 
any of your presentations. Um, we're going to focus on this first panel on uh, domestic responses. Uh, there is definitely more coming ahead uh, in, in the next few months as the Nuclear Regulatory Commission conducts its 90-day review and Congress will undoubtedly hold more hearings. On the international side, we're just beginning to see some responses. Uh, this week, members of the Convention on Nuclear Safety are going to be meeting for their fifth review of the convention, and the International Atomic Energy Agency Director, uh, Yukia Amano, has called for a nuclear safety summit in June. And our second panel of experts will explore uh, the impact of international cooperation and these conventions on nuclear safety. Before I make the introductions to our first panel, I would like to uh, just give you a few administrative notes. Please turn off the ringers on your cell phones <laughs> and Blackberries. Um, this event is on the record. It will be taped. And during the question and answer session, we'll have uh, microphones roving around, and so you just need to raise your hand. Uh, I want to take this opportunity, before I forget, to thank the CSIS staff uh, of the Proliferation Prevention Program for their excellent work in putting this together on a really short notice. Uh, that would be Tamara spitzer Hobika, Keen Hu Chung, and Jungmin Wu. And so now to... Um, introduce our panelists. First we have Alex Flint. Uh, we have, if you didn't get a copy of it, copies of all their bios um, outside as you enter. Um, Alex uh, is Senior Vice President for Governmental Affairs at the Nuclear Energy Institute uh, and has been since February 2006. Before joining NEI, he had a long and illustrious career um, on the Hill uh, and on uh, and lastly, as director of the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy, of the staff of the uh, Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. And he began his career with um, Pete Domenici. I'm going to do all the speakers' bios in a row, and then we'll get to what you really came here for, which is the panelists. Um, after Alex, uh, Ellen Vanko will speak, and she is the Nuclear Energy and Climate Change Project Manager for the Union of Concerned Scientists in Washington, D.C. Um, she's also the Senior Advisor on uh, Federal and State Policies Concerning Electricity Markets, um, Integration of Renewable Energy, Energy Conservation, et cetera. She has more than 25 years of experience as an energy policy professional. Uh, and lastly, we will have Mark Holt from the Congressional Research Service. Mark and I were uh, colleagues uh, when I was there, um, and uh, he was always the one I went to to answer those hard questions. Uh, he's been a policy analyst in um, nuclear energy since 1988, um, and um, some of the CRS reports, if you didn't know this, are available on the web, but you have to look hard for them. So I would like to invite Alex Flint up now to give an industry perspective on the safety challenges. I was just thinking about working on the staff of the Senate Energy Committee. Of course, I learned about the Senate Energy Committee sitting on the back bench while Bennett was running the place. So it's a pleasure. Good to see you, Senator. Um, I wasn't going to mention the word Taurus. Um, in, instead, what I want to do is I want to thank John for the way in which he set the context for this conversation. Uh, I do believe that we are at the beginning of a conversation about nuclear safety after Fukushima. Uh, the situation in Fukushima is obviously not yet concluded, and so it's impossible to draw lessons from the situation. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution of the conversation that we have observed just in the less than three weeks now. Uh, I ha we have been doing innumerable presentations around town, and so I drew a few slides that I want to walk through just to establish maybe some, some points of common understanding, at least from our perspective, that might be relevant to the conversation that we have. Uh, when, we, when this incident occurred and NEI started working 24 hours a day, our, our mode was in information collation and then dissemination. Uh, interestingly, uh, 
now, after a week or so, there have developed a number of other very good sources for information, and I've been impressed by the press coverage. There are certainly a number of reporters who are now getting access to information that is truly impressive and where we are learning from the press rather than the other way around. It was also interesting for me when we started briefing members of Congress and the executive branch and anybody who would listen to us the Monday after the incident, we went several days before anybody asked us about U.S. plants. The conversation was entirely what is happening in Japan. But after several days, we started getting questions about the similarities of plants in the U.S. Could this issue occur? Could these sorts of events occur in the United States? And we spent some time on that, and I'll just get to that in a minute. But then we've seen a further evolution in the conversation. Uh, the conversation, particularly when the Senate Energy and Water Appropriations Committee held their hearing last week, and then uh, when the House Oversight and Investigations Committee of Energy and Commerce held its hearing yesterday, the conversation had evolved to what about spent nuclear fuel on site? What about the back end of the fuel cycle? I don't know what the next evolution in the conversation is, but I recognize that we may be several evolutions from really what the long-range conversation is and where we are trying to learn and draw conclusions from what has happened in Japan. But let me get to particularly to the, the subject at hand, and I will approach it th largely through a political perspective um, it, for several reasons. Number one, it's, it's my beat at NEI, but then also because we do not know the circumstances on the ground at Fukushima in their entirety. Uh, we certainly are able to draw some conclusions, and there has become some accepted conventional wisdom, but we are going to be challenging that conventional wisdom and reevaluating the situation in Fukushima for months and years to come, and so it is inappropriate to draw conclusions today. I want to start, though, in political space. Thursday after the event, the President held a press conference at the White House and I think set the tone not just for the executive branch but really for the country in how to handle this going forward. And John in his introduction talked about uh, the need to take uh, the fear out of this and to start thinking about this in the long range, I think was John's words. The President and the Chairman of the NRC did an exceptional job in that regard Thursday, six days after the event began announced that the NRC would be conducting its review, which is broken into a 90-day review and a long-term review, and I think really establishing the tone, the fact that we would try to understand uh, what had happened in Fukushima before we leapt to conclusions here in the United States. I want to talk just a little bit, and as I said, I drew a number of slides, for, I drew a selection of slides. There's been a lot of discussion about EPZs because in the President's comments that Thursday, he s suggested that the United States would recommend that U.S. Uh, citizens within 50 miles of Fukushima evacuate or shelter in place. I wanted to just make sure that everybody kept in mind the, the way in which we do EPZ work here in the United States. We have a 10-mile emergency planning zone where it is where the instruction is either to be prepared or to shelter in place, depending upon what the circumstances are. We monitor for environmental contamination out to 50 miles. And it's up to the gov largely the governors in consultation with the NRC and with FEMA to determine what has to happen beyond that 10-mile emergency, uh, the EPZ. I've been impressed by the attention that has been focused on the preparation of U.S. nuclear plants for whatever scenarios policymakers or others can dream up right now, and clearly an earthquake that it, as large as the one in Japan and then a tsunami that came ashore at about 45 feet or so are some of the worst scenarios you can possibly imagine. But the NRC has been working on these scenarios and other scenarios for some time. But let me make a broader point. At U.S. nuclear plants, we don't try to understand every particular event or combination of events that a, a can occur. What we try to understand are the symptoms that can result from occurrences. So, for example, the situation at Fukushima, to us, is a station blackout, a complete loss of all on-site power, including the batteries. The causes of that are not particularly important when you try to assess how a U.S. plant will respond to a station blackout. In the United States, most of the thinking that's gone into station blackouts, post 9-11 in particular, have been airplane impacts. What the Fukushima situation has done, and from our chief nuclear officers who have been doing walk-downs of the sites recently, is it's brought a new mindset to the issue. It's what if instead of flames and an air resulting from an airplane impact, 
you're dealing with a situation where you have floods and a lot of water on hand. And how does that affect your views of the preparations? And so there's a lot of learning that comes from this. But at its core, what we're talking about is a station blackout. Now, a station blackout is not the only set of circumstance that, or, that you can find oneself at a, at a plant. But the, uh, the, the, the fact is that, particularly here in the United States, what we do is we prepare for circumstances rather than whatever events lead up to those circumstances. I'm going to skip a slide here. The industry, shortly after this event occurred, began to take both some short-term and some long-term steps to respond to the in inevitable focus on safety at the U.S. plants. First of all, we are verifying readiness to manage extreme events. And I'm going to, on the next slide, I'm going to walk through some of these details. Over the long term, there are going to be important lessons that can be learned from Fukushima when we really understand the facts. There may very well be lessons that we need to import into the United States that may change the, the way we operate, the way we build, and some of the systems that we maintain in the plants. Let me tell you a little bit about what we've done in the short term. The plants have, every one of them, verified their ability to respond to major challenges. I was talking to a site vice president of one plant who, after 9-11, implemented a number of changes, 128 different changes, that they then went and walked down over the last week to ensure that all of the preparations they'd made under B5B, which was the NRC's regulations post 9-11, that they had responded and that their systems were in place and were operating. They did very well in their walk down. But they also said it was very interesting to contemplate a completely different set of scenarios that could result in some of those systems needing to be used, a flood, a hurricane, a force five hurricane, something else very different than an airplane. A lot of attention has been focused on loss of off-site power. Uh, clearly, as a result of that, a lot of attention is being paid to diesel generators, backup batteries, uh, flood scenarios. And on my concluding slide, I want to give you some, some details. Now, I've picked a slide that is from one of NEI's member companies. Uh, and I don't want to represent this slide as representing the industry as a whole. But I did want to walk you through to at least one slide that does have a picture of a Taurus on it, I'm afraid, um, to give you a sense of some of the upgrades that may distinguish U.S. plants from Japanese plants. And I say may because we do not know what upgrades and modifications have been made to plants in Japan. And that's going to be one of the key elements that we have to learn in coming months and coming years. Okay, You have a BWR. And you have on the side a list of upgrades and improvements that have resulted largely from s important incidents that have affected the industry. So after TMI, there were upgrades and changes made to control room layouts and to procedures within the plants. Uh, in the 80s, the toruses were reinforced. There was concern about their ability to survive ex stresses, both from thermal loads but also from exterior sources. And there were upgrades made to the toruses. After, in 1979, fire protection. You'll notice there are two diesel generators on that picture. There were redundancies put in in backup systems following a fire. Uh, you'll see in 1992, the NRC required the construction of hardened con containment vents. You'll see that that's the pipe leading up the left-hand side of the reactor. It's our assumption that if those had been used at a, at a reactor like the ones in Fukushima, that hydrogen would have been vented off and there would not have been an explosion within secondary containment. But to this point, I will tell you that now I'm getting mixed signals as to whether or not the Japanese have hardened vents on their reactors. And it's a perfect example of where I'd like to be able to draw a comparison, but until we really understand the circumstances and the physical characteristics of the plants in Japan, we'll be unable to do that. 1988 was when the NRC imposed station blackout requirements. Uh, a, lot of time, a lot of focus was put on those after 9-11, uh, uh, when additional uh, systems were put in place, including spare diesel pumps and generators, so that, for example, reactors that may already have three or four backup diesel generators now have a portable diesel generator on site. Uh, a lot of facilities have hardened containment for both their generators and the fuel supply on site. And they also have new requ retire requirements for battery backup power. So I list these things not as a comparison, and I need to be explicit, of the U.S. plants versus the Japanese plants, but simply to discuss the way in which U.S. plants have evolved as regulatory requirements have evolved, as the U.S. industry has learned from experiences here in the United States, and we'll make upgrades and changes to both the, the, the physical uh, 
plants as well as the way in which the plants are operated. Uh, with, with that, I'm going to conclude. Uh, I, I want to emphasize my appreciation for CSIS beginning this sort of conversation. There are going to be a lot of conversations in town about nuclear safety. We welcome that. Uh, it's appropriate that these conversations occur. Uh, we do need to make sure that before we make changes that we really understand the circumstances so that if necessary we can make appropriate changes in the operation of not just U.S. plants but plants around the world. And we welcome that conversation. I suspect it's going to take a long time and that this conversation is going to go on for several years. Uh, but I appreciate CSIS being here at the beginning of it. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Alex. We're, we're going to hear all three presentations and then start the Q&A session. So, Ellen Vanko, you may have the microphone. Thank you, Sharon, um, and thank you, everybody, for coming. I, I can say that I won't even drive a Taurus <laughs> since it's <laughs> couldn't resist. Um, since its founding in 1969, the Union of Concerned Scientists has worked to make nuclear power plants safer and more secure. We have also sought to minimize the level of risks that nations and terrorists could acquire nuclear weapons material from nuclear power facilities. Uh, we have a 40-year history of doing that. Um, as the events unfolding in Japan do make starkly clear, once again, nuclear power poses serious risks that are unique among the energy options being considered to reduce global warming emissions. The future risks of nuclear energy will depend in large part on whether governments, industry, and international bodies take serious efforts to address these risks before we move forward with expanding the nuclear reactor fleet, whether it's in the U.S. or abroad. It's also important to point out, again, from our organization's perspective, that the risks posed by climate change are so grave that we cannot afford to rule out nuclear power as a major contributor to addressing global warming. Prudence dictates that we develop as many options to reduce global warming emissions as possible, and that we take into account their impact on public health, safety, and security. Uh, we also need to take into account the time required for large-scale deployment of these technologies, as well as their costs. We should begin by deploying low-carbon technologies that achieve the largest reductions most quickly and with the lowest cost and risks. Today, nuclear power does not meet those criteria. Any expansion of nuclear must occur under effective regulations and an appropriate level of oversight, while new research and development is needed to focus on enhancing safety, security, and waste disposal. However, until these long-standing problems are resolved, uh, you know, the, whether, whether these problems are going to be caused by accidents, acts of terrorism, or acts of God, the potential for nuclear power to play a significant role in addressing global warming will be held hostage both to the industry's worst performers and to our own worst nightmares. So how will the events in Japan affect the construction of new reactors in the United States? I'm afraid I'm not smart enough to know and stupid enough to say, but I, I think it would be naive to say that this ongoing catastrophe uh, will have no impact on the nuclear industry in this country. The first impact will be on existing reactors, and I think everybody agrees with that. A thorough assessment is needed to ensure that these reactors are being operated as safely and securely as possible, that existing NRC regulations and standards governing nuclear plant safety and security are fully enforced, and that any necessary improvements to NRC requirements are identified and implemented quickly. The impact on new reactors is less clear. The nuclear renaissance in the United States was in trouble long before last month's earthquake and tsunami. Spiraling construction cost estimates, declining energy demand, low natural gas prices, and the failure to place a price on carbon already spelled trouble for the industry. Um, that's not just my view. Uh, the, largest, the, the CEO of the largest uh, nuclear utility in the United States told the American Enterprise Institute just days before the earthquake and tsunami that he would not invest in new reactors because they are uneconomic compared to other low carbon alternatives like energy efficiency, natural gas, uprates at existing reactors, and I would add other low carbon energy sources like wind and, and, and solar and hydro. Um, but in his view and in mine, um, this is going to create a very difficult or would have created a very difficult economic situation for the nuclear industry before Fukushima even occurred. 
In terms of building new reactors, I believe we need to hit the pause button until we've dealt with the problems of the current reactor fleet. The crisis underway at Fukushima Daiichi has revealed serious nuclear safety shortcomings that have major implications for nuclear power plants in the United States and around the world. Although the events in Japan are still unfolding, it is not too soon to begin to learn lessons from the evidence available so far. The Nuclear Re Regulatory Commission is initiating comprehensive internal reviews of its regulations and practices, but stringent external oversight will be needed to ensure that these reviews effectively challenge prior assumptions that the Fukushima crisis has called into question and that any weaknesses identified by these reviews are promptly corrected. Just yesterday, Dr. Edwin Lyman, uh, gave testimony on behalf of the Union of Concerned Scientists before the House C Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. The hearing was titled, The U.S. Government Response to the Nuclear Power Plant Incident in Japan. Um, Congress has, has a way with words. Uh, in his testimony, and, and copies of Ed's testimony are outside of the room, along with testimony Dave Lockbaum gave to several Senate committees just the week before. He's the director of our nuclear safety program. Uh, both outline uh, some of the areas where th we think steps can be taken right away to, to, alert, to take advantage of some of the lessons we already know. Uh, the first is that the NRC should strengthen the requirements to cope with prolonged losses of electric power, i.e. station blackout, in order to prevent damage to reactor cores and spent fuel. The NRC should require the accelerated transfer of spent fuel from densely packed wet pools to dry casks. The NRC should strengthen requirements for management of severe events that cause damage to reactor cores and spent fuel and ensure plans are realistic and workable. Finally, the NRC should revise emergency planning requirements in the vicinity of U.S. nuclear plants to ensure that all populations at risk from excessive radiation exposure will be protected. These are our, our initial and most critical recommendations. I expect that more will be forthcoming. The biggest lesson we can learn from the unfolding disaster in Japan is that no matter how technologically advanced a society is, and Japan is certainly an advanced society, it is impossible to fully plan for every curveball that Mother Nature can throw or to prevent catastrophic events from affecting a nation's critical infrastructure, including roads, bridges, power plants, and telecommunication systems. In Japan, these events even wiped out the emergency first responders' capability to respond to the first two events, never mind the third. Uh, I don't, you know, we, it's obvious they didn't plan for that. It's not sure that anybody can plan for, for every possible combination of events. I, I agree with Alex on that point. Uh, but one of my lesser known talents that, that I really didn't expect to call on again is the fact that I'm a FEMA certified, in, in, I'm certified in the FEMA Incident Command System. I've, I've consulted with utilities on, on reviewing and improving their their disaster response plans. So, so I am quite familiar with what these, these companies are and are not prepared to deal with and how well many of them are or are not prepared. Despite these lapses and, and, and weaknesses that we already know about, it doesn't mean we should not put in place all practical mechanisms to protect our citizens and the environment from known hazards that could occur if reactors are not planned, built, and operated in a safe and secure manner. Unfortunately, we've just been reminded that a large scale of expansion in, of nuclear power in the U.S. under existing conditions would, would be accompanied by an increased risk of catastrophic events, risks not associated with any other non-nuclear means for global, addressing global warming. Again, you know what the risks are. I'm not going to repeat them today. Thanks to a 24-7 news cycle, we're watching one of those events unfold in real time with all of its attendant hazards. I wouldn't want to be a nuclear industry CEO right now. They've just seen their highly depreciated, high load factor, low cost, low carbon assets turned into very large liabilities. According to a just released analysis by UBS, Fukushima is worse for the nuclear industry than Chernobyl. In a 140 page report looking at the future of the global nuclear industry, the UBS analysts say, and I quote, while the 1986 Chernobyl accident, at least to date, had a significantly greater environmental impact, we would argue that Fukushima raises even larger credibility issues for the nuclear industry than previous accidents. They say this for two reasons. First, Fukushima is happening in an advanced economy using American Japanese reactor technology. It is not happening in a totalitarian state with substandard technology and no safety culture. The second reason is that the size and duration of this accident is unprecedented. Four reactors are facing significant damage, 
and it has already lasted more than three weeks without engineers getting the situation under control. The UBS report predictably forecasts that safety regulations will be tightened, adding that plants' life extensions will likely be legally limited, with many plants forced to shut down in a bid to appease public concerns. The report names 30 plants that the authors believe are particularly vulnerable. Even more significantly, especially for investors and nuclear providers, UBS argues that there could be an entire reevaluation of the risk of nuclear companies, both by governments and insurers. This could mean that not just higher operating costs for operators, but a greater chance that if the worst should happen, procedures will have been put in place to make sure that there is no taxpayer bailout. Again, to quote from the report, if the government takes the risk, then it needs to take into account this risk when deciding future energy policy. But if liability will be wholly or partly with the operators, we think discount rates will likely need to be higher. In other words, investors will need to adjust to the reality of nuclear operators being significantly more risky than other utilities. Up until now, nuclear operators and investors have been living in a fantasy land where Price Anderson protects them from intolerable losses in the event of a catastrophic accident. Given that no one at this time can possibly put a price tag on the eventual cost of the Fukushima disaster, I can easily surmise that it will run into the many tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars, and that does not include the cost of replacing the power that was produced by the now disabled plants. Therefore, the current industry limits under Price-Anderson can be expected to receive serious scrutiny in this country. I do not believe they will hold, but again, I don't pretend to be able to predict the future. In summary, the UBS report states that the big winners from Fukushima will be gas and, to a lesser extent, coal and renewables. The big loser, of course, will be nuclear power. <coughs> With every crisis comes opportunity. The crisis in Japan gives us the opportunity to ensure that nothing like this ever happens here. We can start by not saying that it can't happen here. The Russians came to Three Mile Island and said it couldn't happen there. The Japanese went to Chernobyl and said it couldn't happen there. Over the past month, I have heard U.S. nuclear executives, politicians, and industry supporters say it can't happen here. I wish I could say that, and I'm, and I'm very happy to hear that, that Alex is not willing to say that because we don't have all the facts and that it's going to take us a very long time to know what they are. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ellen. Um, Mark? <laughs> Thanks, Sharon, for inviting me to this uh, very timely and interesting program, and I'm certainly happy to give uh, some of uh, the congressional perspective. <clears throat> Again, I'm with the Congressional Research Service, which is part of the Library of Congress. Uh, our mission is to provide objective, timely, confidential, and authoritative information and anal analysis to Congress. As part of that uh, mission, CRS did, does not advocate policy. So, as always, I'll be watching my words very carefully to ensure that I do not appear to be favoring one side or the other. If I appear to be doing so, it's a mistake. So. <clears throat> and as Sharon mentioned, I've been at CRS since uh, 1988, and I also was uh, covering nuclear energy issues for Congress since uh, the beginning of 1985 with the Environmental and Energy Study Conference. And uh, so, I do go back far enough on this, hopefully, to provide a little bit of perspective on uh, what's been, so far, a very short period of time for uh, congressional reaction to this uh, situation. Uh, what I've seen is a con congressional response so far seems to be falling into three major areas, and those are, uh, first, the specific nuclear power plant safety issues that we've been hearing about. And the second is the role of uh, how the accident might affect the role of nuclear power in uh, future U.S. energy policy, <clears throat> and the third has been an, the effect of the accident on nuclear waste policy. And of course, those overlap to some degree, but that seems to be the three major areas. Statements and actions so far uh, from members of Congress have included all those areas. And of course, talking about the, the reaction of Congress is a little misleading. So far, uh, the substantive res responses have been from individual members of Congress or senators or groups of members, um, and they're uh, as opposed to any kind of um, 
formal action by subcommittees, committees, either House or, of course, Congress as a whole, other than hearings, which you've heard about. There have been several hearings so far. So the reactions are really pretty much individual. We don't really know what Congress thinks yet, but uh, we can certainly look at what members have said so far. So what we've seen from the immediate reaction, of course, the images of uh, nuclear reactor buildings in Japan exploding one after another uh, was a huge shock around the world. I was actually in Europe when that occurred, and it's certainly uh, as shocking there as I assume it was here, but I got back as quickly as I could. Um, and of course, uh, I did discuss with my colleagues who were left here <laughs> uh, responding uh, immediately uh, as to what was the most immediate uh, questions that we were getting from Congress. And certainly the most immediate types of questions were, uh, as Alex mentioned, local concern, dealing with uh, members who saw that uh, the designs of the Fukushima reactors were in fact similar to a number of U.S. designs, in fact, near many congressional districts, so they were concerned about that. We got a lot of questions about uh, seismic uh, um, qualifications of U.S. plants here because they may have been at a, you know, a Mark I reactor near an uh, um, earthquake zone, so they wanted to know about that. So that was sort of the immediate reaction. But then um, possibly that may have been mitigated a little bit <clears throat> by the, uh, of course, the horrifying images of the tsunami may have seemed almost surreal to viewers in the United States because that is not really a uh, a type of disaster that most of the United States is really subject to. And in fact, Senator Franken noted that during the, uh, during the uh, Senate uh, Energy and Water Subcommittee hearing on this, and that said, well, if we have a, something along the lines, if we have a tsunami in Minnesota, we're in, in really big trouble, which is certainly true. But he also went on, of course, to make the larger point, which is not that he was concerned about a tsunami in Minnesota, but concerned about similar or any other type of incident that could cause a station blackout that could result in the same problems. But the hearing, several hearings have been held, as was noted. Uh, they've been very well attended, more well attended than a typical hearing. That is, I mean, attendance by the members of the committees. So that certainly is a sign of uh, in intense congressional interest in this. Typically, uh, the hearings have focused on trying to find out facts about the in uh, accident, what did happen, and of course, as we know, that's still ongoing. We don't really know. Uh, and then the safety implications for U.S. reactors, and then often, uh, in fact, invariably in the hearings, the, uh, the subject of nuclear waste policy comes up, and also maybe the effects on new, new reactors. So in, the, in uh, one of the immediate reactions after uh, the accident was for uh, a lot of sort of restatements of positions on nuclear power in general, what does it mean? And of course, the Obama administration did re reiterate its support for nuclear power as part of its uh, clean energy program as stated in the State of the Union address. And the administration is still uh, sticking by the uh, $36 billion expansion in loan guarantees for nuclear power. And uh, it appears so far that nuclear power supporters in Congress have not changed their, that support, at least not that I've seen. Although it does appear that perhaps there's been less emphasis recently on uh, uh, urging of the NRC to speed up pending licenses. That had been a big uh, theme in a lot of the congressional debate recently, and that I've not seen that recently. Uh, the Democrats uh, in Congress that I've seen uh, make a statement s seem to not be opposing the administration on its nuclear power policy, but of course many have expressed uh, significant safety concerns, so there's clearly some unease there that presumably will be uh, addressed as, as uh, the issues are continued to be uh, examined. I thought that an interchange at that same hearing between uh, Senators uh, Feinstein and Alexander was uh, very indicative of the, of the very, very different uh, paradigms that that the uh, that people uh, that members of Congress are coming at this. That was the point. If anybody was there at, toward the end of the hearing, Senator Alexander introduced into the record a um, an article by the British environmentalist uh, George Monbiot, saying that the Fukushima accident had 
turned him from neutral to pro-nuclear power because um, in his mind this was the worst uh, natural catastrophe that could uh, affect a nuclear power plant and that the results were uh, much less than the typical uh, health effects of, um, of other types of energy sources, particularly coal. And the res response of Senator Feinstein uh, was uh, really, I'm, at, I'm not sure that Senator Alexander explained exactly what the article was very clearly because as soon as she heard uh, the, 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 react, the, the, the uh, results of the accident were not very severe or something along the line, she uh, uh, clearly was very shocked. And uh, it was just, uh, at that point, that pretty much, uh, there was almost no communication happening at that point. And so that may be where we're coming from uh, as far as congressional debate. It's really two different views as to the dangers of nuclear power and radiation and, and that type of thing. So that's maybe color the debate considerably. <clears throat> but certainly, as far as the uh, safety issues that have been raised, we've heard a lot about them. I'm just going to mention them briefly without discussing them in detail. Uh, but the things that, that have been raised in Congress so far are, of course, earthquake and flood resistance, station blackout, spent fuel pools, uh, the potassium iodide uh, or KI pills, how, how, how widely those should be distributed, uh, contamination of the ocean and seafood safety, which we actually wrote a report on that there was so much interest in that, uh, use of uh, MOX fuel, international nuclear safety, license extension for new U.S. reactors, <clears throat> emergency planning zones, and, and, and emergency planning in general, uh, hydrogen management in severe accidents, uh, licensing of new reactors and new designs. All of those topics have come up and certainly are in, in play at this point in Congress. As far as nuclear energy policy in general, it's, of course, as was mentioned, we're still in the very early stages of that, and so um, how this will affect that in the long run is really hard to tell. Ultimately, the effect on U.S. nuclear policy will depend on how the accident does unfold. It is, we're still in the middle of it. It is not contained. We don't really know what the extent of contamination is, how soon, uh, how long uh, residents will have to stay out of certain areas. Uh, it's really, really unclear. So um, that will have a big impact on ultimately probably uh, what Congress may decide in, uh, on a big picture of nuclear policy. But certainly our analysis, and I think about every other analysis, indicates that the expansion of, or any expansion of nuclear power in the United States does depend very heavily on federal policy. Uh, in general, uh, the, in the United States, the uh, New nuclear power plants are uh, more expensive than competing technologies, and uh, even with incentives that are now available, uh, it, it, our analysis uh, indicates that, that more needs to be done, at least on a pure economic case. Now, uh, licenses for about 20 reactors are currently pending at NRC, but uh, their future is really uncertain at this point. A lot of them are, are on hold or they're just getting a license, and not that many have made a commitment to move forward. <clears throat> so it really does depend on federal policy, so this debate, of course, is very important. Many of the nuclear projects that were announced had uh, prominently noted that the reason that nuclear power was being considered was uh, in anticipation of federal greenhouse gas or carbon controls. And, of course, there was the, uh, in the previous Congress a major debate over carbon controls with the cap-and-trade proposals that passed the House. And it was certainly... Uh, expected that any type of cap-and-trade system would be a, a huge benefit to nuclear power. Of course, that did not pass last Congress, but the uh, President's Clean Energy Standard announced in the State of the Union Address could potentially provide a similar type of benefit. Of course, that would mean that would be uh, nuclear power would be uh, one of the technologies that would be, uh, uh, that would help a given utility meet the 80 percent clean energy goal, which is, of course, a very high standard. And so potentially that could, could take the place of the cap and trade, uh, keeping nuclear power in play. But of course, the competition from natural gas has, has been a, a serious issue. That was the other, besides the uh, carbon controls, natural gas uh, competition was probably the other main driving force, but, but be, uh, behind these uh, reactor projects that are currently announced. Uh, gas prices had been uh, wildly volatile and had been spiked to extremely high levels. Of course, now with the uh, 
shale gas seemingly in plentiful supply for the foreseeable future. That may uh, be an issue. And also, of course, the uh, inclusion of gas in the clean energy standard at a half credit rate could also uh, be an important consideration. Uh, new safety requirements that might result from the uh, accident, Fukushima accident, uh, obviously could increase the cost of nuclear power even more and be a factor. As was mentioned, it could increase the risk perception, plant financing, making perhaps the federal loan guarantees more important again. And of course, uh, potential uh, opposition by the public has not been seen widely to the proposed plants that we've seen so far, but that uh, potential impact of that is not yet clear. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, I was discussing with him this, this morning, uh, who was uh, actually from the uh, uh, the environmental uh, policy world uh, did not think that, pu that public opposition had had a major impact in the past, but so that's sort of an interesting, an interesting side note. But still, of course, it's not clear what the public reaction is ultimately going to be. And nuclear waste policy has also been uh, in play in Congress, and the uh, many, many comments have been made in Congress that uh, the accident uh, should be a uh, should be evidence against the Obama administration's policy of canceling the Yucca Mountain repository, in in that it would tend to mean that uh, spent fuel would stay at reactor sites longer. And of course, uh, the response has been the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's nuclear future will be. Uh, issuing its draft report in July, and that at that time, maybe the debate should begin in earnest. And so that will be certainly of great interest, but the extent to which the uh, Fukushima accident and, and the effect that it, that it had on the spent fuel pools apparently uh, will be part of that debate as well. Um, <clears throat> not a huge number of bills have been introduced yet uh, related to this. Uh, in comparison to prior uh, similar incidents, but there are at least uh, three or four so far that are directly related to the uh, to the accident. Mo most notably, probably being the uh, Nuclear Power Plant Safety Act, HR 1242, by Congressman Markey, introduced March 29th, and uh, that is the most detailed so far on nuclear safety issues, directly addressing some of the nuclear safety concerns that have been raised. Uh, uh, particularly by the Un Union of Concerned Scientists and other groups related to the uh, accident. It would essentially uh, delay new licenses and design approvals for 18 months, while NRC would implement uh, new regulations on sta station blackout, spent fuel pools, and a number of other specific requirements. <clears throat> the uh, also introduced was uh, really reintroduced, although it modified uh, was the further, Furthering International Nuclear Safety Act, which we may hear more about in the second panel, <clears throat> which is S640 and um, H.R. 1326 by Senator Akaka and Congressman Fortenberry, and that would, uh, is intended to strengthen the effectiveness of the Convention on Nuclear Safety, which of course is currently holding its fifth review meeting in Vienna. <clears throat> and then there's the Nuclear Power Licensing Reform Act, H.R. 1268, by uh, Congressman uh, Lowy, which would expand evacuation planning zones to 50 miles, among other measures. So those are out there, uh, certainly many more to come, no doubt. We haven't had any legislative hearings yet, so it's sort of certainly hard to see what Congress's reaction will be. <clears throat> but maybe to put it in context, I wanted to discuss congressional reaction to uh, some of the previous major uh, incidents, nuclear and otherwise, that have affected nuclear policy, specifically Three Mile Island accident, Chernobyl, and the 9-11 attacks, which do show a little bit about the possible timing and mechanisms for congressional action that occur after such an incident. And of course, most proposals <clears throat> are ultimately not enacted. But uh, just because it's not enacted doesn't mean that it does not uh, have some effect. Congressional action typically is in parallel with executive branch action, especially NRC in these cases, as, as you will see. So really, in many cases, it's not that <clears throat> Congress uh, swoops in and uh, imposes a lot of new requirements. It's often more, uh, in, in many cases, uh, endorsing steps that have been already taken or contemplated or agreed to by pretty much all the major players in most cases. 
and, stat and putting statutory uh, framework on them, which is important in many cases. I mean, the wording of the statute does matter, as we have seen. <clears throat> After the Three Mile Island accident, uh, March 1979, we're started in March 79, obviously a huge shock to the uh, U.S. Uh, nuclear power uh, community, including policymakers. It showed really that some of the past, at least one of the postulated serious accidents could really happen. <clears throat> I did, uh, do know a, a nuclear engineer who was working at GE at the time, and his description of the scene in, uh, you know, in the engineering department was uh, really grim. It was really that, that you could see that the uh, people were truly stunned that that this could really happen, and uh, even though it wasn't their reactor at that time. <clears throat> but, uh, of course, this resulted in, in many hearings, uh, very, very intense congressional scrutiny, major congressional investigations, especially the Senate Environment Committee, which is the oversight committee for NRC, primarily resulting, a lot of the ideas that were, that were uh, brought up were included in the NRC authorization of 1980, which was June 1980, so that was pretty quick. That was only a little more than a year after the accident. Uh, most notably requiring emergency plans and a number of other changes to the Atomic Energy Act. But of course, many major uh, responses to TMI continued for years afterward, especially with NRC, and it took a long time to work all those through. Uh, and um, so it was not a quick response overall, but Congress acted relatively quickly. Now in Chernobyl, which was April 86, as was mentioned, this was not really very similar to U.S. nuclear power plants, <clears throat> and that was made clear pretty early on. Hearings there, I was there for those, and uh, uh, they were very, um, uh, the intensity level was, was very high as far as participants. It was very serious. They didn't know, you know, if, if huge numbers of people had died immediately because it was such an uh, immediate accident as opposed to slightly slower unfolding Fukushima. But eventually it became clear that uh, it wasn't necessarily a, a lot of lessons for uh, the nuclear power industry, but then there were uh, uh, the, the Department of Energy production reactors that some of them were similar in, in uh, technology, uh, specifically the N reactor at Hanford and also the Brookhaven graphite research reactor, both of which were ultimately shut down, not necessarily because congress of congressional action, but certainly there was congressional pressure, and, and at that point, Again, uh, executive branch, policymakers, everybody working together uh, did sort of reach a consensus that this had to be done. A uh, debate on the Price-Anderson Act that was mentioned was certainly affected by both uh, Chernobyl and TMI, and this was the, uh, the, the mid-80s um, uh, extension that ultimately, I guess, was 88. And I'm certainly happy to see Senator Johnson here, who was uh, very, very involved in that. And, uh, Certainly, the, uh, the, the increases in the um, uh, liability limits were affected. The Convention on Nuclear Safety grew out of Chernobyl, and that was an example of a very slow-moving uh, reaction. Uh, the U.S. supported the um, IAEA resolution in 1991. The agreement entered into force in 1996, and the U.S. Senate did not ratify it until 1999. Of course, now we're a full participating member. Now, the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks uh, also had a, a, although that was not a nuclear attack, it certainly raised a lot of questions about, in Congress, about uh, nuclear security because it was thought that the nuclear power plants were one of the potential targets. And uh, there was certainly congressional reaction to that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in 2002, uh, as part of the Bioterrorism uh, Act, the uh, uh, potassium iodide pill stockpiling and distribution was authorized, and of course that's a a recurring issue in Congress that that, that was actually not implemented. Uh, the 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 iodine pills that are authorized uh, that are being done now are only uh, through NRC in the in the ten mile zone. But this 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 2002 provision was not implemented. And then many of the other uh, proposals, the design basis threat, that's the amount of uh, number of attackers and the force that can be used, that can be assumed to be brought against a nuclear power plant, uh, force on force exercises to drill. The uh, power plant security forces were all, and many other proposals, were included in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, so that was almost four years later. But uh, those were debated uh, very intensively during that period of time in Congress. So that gives a little bit of a, a picture. We were looking at a long road ahead. We're only at the very beginning. It's still too early to tell how this particular uh, accident 
will be uh, played out, which, uh, which of the earlier crises perhaps is the most relevant model of what might happen. So certainly uh, I and everybody else will be watching that with great interest. And I guess with that, we'll turn to questions. Thank you. <laughs> That's a lot to think about. Um, <clears throat> while you are gathering your thoughts, I will take the prerogative of the chair and pose a few of my own questions. But um, Tamara and Key are at the back uh, with microphones, and uh, you just need to raise your hand and we'll get to you. I will ask you um, to identify yourself and your affiliation. and. Um, <laughs> and make it a question. <laughs> so you can raise your voice at the end or you can say, isn't that right? Um, but, uh, but we have these three fantastic experts here and we should take advantage of, um, of their expertise. I will start off with one question for Alex and we may actually talk about this in the second session on when we talk about international cooperation, but this issue of um, the U.S. requiring specific improvements to the Mark I containment for the GE boiling water reactors. Um, my understanding from talking to, uh, and you're absolutely correct, we don't exactly know what improvements were made by the Japanese. Um, my understanding is that GE built the first Daiichi number one plant and then uh, Toshiba and, Hit and Hitachi, right, I think, an both, evolution. right, there was an evolution. So there were other uh, companies, the Japanese companies, then built those plants on the GE design. But my question is, <laughs> I talked to a GE technician and he said, yes, when we did these improvements, we gave them the information. So in other words, their calculations of what additional sort of stresses or whatever needed to be done. And then the Japanese took the information and did their own thing. So my question is, if we are going to look at a significant nuclear expansion across the world, and, and some of these countries like China and, and, you know, who knows in the future, may be taking that technology and then doing their own thing with it, is that is that good enough? Should we feel good about that? Uh, gee, I gave you the mathematical calculations, and I, I don't know. Is there any way to address this? Do you think? So, uh, it's a profoundly important question, and I don't have an answer. But let me give you some insight as to how we're thinking about it, um, b because it, there there have been a number of statements here today that are related to this. The first is we have a lot of respect for the Japanese nuclear program. Uh, and we are in a world in which there are 65 new reactors under construction outside, worldwide right now, uh, and the majority of them outside the United States. And, and we are now contemplating a scenario where non-nuclear countries begin de their own development programs. Uh, I, I think the, um, the, I'm going to reverse the way in which you asked the question. There are countries whose GDP expansion and their needs for energy are causing them to consider building new nuclear, uh, as along with a whole suite of other technologies. I think it's fair to presume that a number of countries will enter the, the nuclear energy business. And the Japanese situation puts on the forefront the need to ensure that those facilities are constructed and operated in accordance with acceptable practices. And I use acceptable without another adjective because I, it's, your question goes to the core of how do we define what those practices are, what those standards are, and how do we ensure that plants are built to those standards and then operated to those standards and evolve over decades to, to meet evolving standards. Uh, I, I don't have an answer to that question, but what I do think we have to do is we've got to recognize that inevitably we are going to see new plants built in other countries, and we need to develop solutions to the question that you've asked. Do we have some questions from the audience? So right up here, Corey. And then. Hi, Corey Hinderstein with the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Um, my question is, um, since we're looking, since this panel is looking at domestic response, one of the things we saw without needing to understand yet exactly what happened in Japan was an interesting split in this country between the responsibility of the Department of Energy, 
for being the main governmental point of, um, of response and of managing um, the U.S. Um, assistance. The industry, which in some ways wanted to assist and had some resources to bear and couldn't figure out how to either get that to Japan or, as is so, hop so often happens in our system, couldn't figure out how to work with the DOE to go through that route. And we even saw in the press some interesting dynamics where U.S. officials were being asked questions that they were referring to the NRC by saying, look, in this country we have a split and the people who know regu no, no reactors are at the NRC. So are there any lessons we can draw just within our system as to how we can better work those three pieces, the administration, the industry, and the regulator in order to either prepare for something that could happen here or make sure we're meeting the requirements that we should be meeting here, as well as assisting in cases of, of crisis in other places. Mm -hmm. Who would? Yeah, I, mean, I, I would like to start. I, I mean, I think the first thing, uh, one of the things that the, uh, again, talking as a, as a emergency pre preparedness and disaster Sector response sensitive person, as opposed to a nuclear technology expert, my reaction was there was no uh, there was no coordinated response on an international basis. Uh, there there didn't uh, if there was a plan it wasn't implemented, but it suggested to me that there was no plan, and you had various entities both. Uh, from the International Atomic Energy Agency all, all the way around to all the various countries, all speaking in separate voices. So, so that tells me that just from an awareness and preparedness and, and um, crisis response standpoint uh, to communicating with the public about what the risks are and are not, whether it's, it's, it's this event in Japan or it's a similar event in the United States or somewhere else, um, you know, when you have the government of Japan saying we're evacuating everybody to 12 miles, and you have know, the president of the United States saying, well, I think everybody at a 50-mile uh, radius should leave, it raised a couple questions um, as to, you know, uh, well, who should we listen to? And, and my concern was li less for the, the U.S. citizens that heeded the 50-mile warning than for the Japanese citizens that were, you know, closer to 12. Um, so, so just a better, a, a better and more coordinated mm -hmm. national uh, international response and, and communications plan would be hu a huge improvement over what we have today. I would suggest that the same thing in terms of an international investigation mechanism for investigating this and ensuring that all nations, whether they uh, operate nuclear power plants today or are, you know, want to build nuclear reactors in the future, um, there needs to be an international mechanism. I know it's been discussed. I know it's been considered. I know it's been debated, but, but where exactly it stands is, is, is as far as actually becoming a meaningful body uh, with the ability to develop and enforce standards, it's, it's to me a long way off, but we definitely need to move there. Um, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Alex made the comment, you know, it's, it's fair to, you know, that, that, that as nations GDP rises, um, they're going to aspire to improve their energy situation and, and they're considering nuclear. My concern is that it's fair to say that the GDP of some of these nations is larger than the cost of building these reactors. So if you look at whether they're going to look at uh, improving safety or improving their energy situation, you may end up with people not being able to put safety measures in place simply because they can't afford them. So, so to the extent there's a larger international body that can I, I don't know, I can't say prevent, but can pre place pressure on such nations to make sure that safety isn't cut in order to be able to get the next new reactor is, is something that's going to be absolutely critical. I'm sorry, you, you were the, there were three pieces, but those, those are the two I'm, uh, and, your, and your comment was the third, I, I missed it. I'll leave that to Alex. <laughs> that's, that's not fair. I was about to talk, but not on what you just directed me to talk about. Um, I, I was going to make an observation about U.S. government coordination. Um, we, starting on the 11th and again go through, going through the weekend, we were in contact with individuals in uh, not every branch of government, but a lot of branches of government, and we saw the evolution of their knowledge and their thinking, and there certainly were disparate thoughts initially. But I'll tell you, I, I think the U.S. government actually did a very good job of coordinating its response. I, I, the Surgeon General's comment might be the single exception to that. But certainly by, by Thursday when the White House was pulling in 
both the, the, the NSC staff, the NRC, and DOE, and that resulted in the President's statement, I, I thought there was a, a, a remarkable effort to ensure that they were delivering the same message. And, and from certainly the sort of the top level messages that we've been seeing since that point in time, they have been consistent. And so I, I only point to that one example where I think there really wasn't coordination in the early days. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Mark, um, did you want to? Oh, Senator Johnson, unless you had a comment. Uh, this is a question for Ellen Devanko. I'm Bennett Johnston with Johnston and Associates. Uh, Ellen, I'm, I was glad to see the Union of Concerned Scientists come out for dry cast storage, which I've been for for a long time. It's been my experience in some three decades of dealing with nuclear waste, uh, the, the, the problem of it, that it is principally a political problem as opposed to a scientific problem. I mean, there, there are various ways to solve it. Uh, dry cast storage is one way. My, uh, my chosen way would be uh, monitored retrievable storage, at, 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 with Yucca Mountain being a good, good site for that, uh, along with, uh, with several other sites. My question is, do you agree that it is, there are a lot of scientific ways that are not really that difficult scientifically to solve the problem of nuclear waste. And uh, how do you feel about uh, monitored retrievable storage? And should we rule out uh, Yucca Mountain for that purpose or any other purpose on a scientific basis? Well, you've asked me more questions than I can possibly remember. <laughs> um, but, but thank you for them. Uh, I think um, I, UCS has come out in, 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 in support of long-term storage in, in, ca in dry casks. Uh, and our estimates are 50 years. Others have, have said it can be safely uh, stored there for as long as 100. But, but in the, in the lifespan of a, a nuclear waste um, fuel assembly, that's, that's only a fraction of the time we need to deal with it. Um, to the extent we have uh, nuclear waste dispersed in various parts of this country and there's a way of safely transporting and storing it into fewer sites and, 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 and that's where I'm, I'm guessing you mean you're coming from on the interim. Uh, I, I think there's, there's support for that to the extent it can be done in a way that reduces risks, especially at, at, at numerous reactors that are will shortly be decommissioned. If there's a way to reduce uh, waste on, on those sites into fewer, then that probably reduces public risk, does not increase it. Uh, as far as the long-term waste storage, I agree. I think it's, it's largely a political issue. It's not that we can't find uh, long-term storage, um, permanent storage, but doing it in, in, in uh, you know, I, I, there are plenty of problems with Yucca Mountain that I, I can't go into. I've never really been involved in the Yucca Mountain debate, so I must must give that disclaimer. Uh, but, big, big problem being Harry Reid. Um, I, like I said, I, I give that disclaimer. But um, the, the reality is uh, we probably can't cite them in the places where they would be most appropriately stored to, and I'm sure that you could name the senator of every one of those states, and you probably know them personally. So, uh, you know, it's, it's an intractable problem, and therefore, um, we've, we've, but we've got to get rid of the immediate problem, which is wet fuel or wet storage pools on sites in highly populated areas where the, the waste is being concentrated in increasing amounts because we don't have a place to put it. Any other comments from the panel on this question? Okay, we'll take a question from Meg. Thanks very much, Sharon. Margaret Ryan. Um, the, and I'm really following up on Senator Johnson. Speak into the microphone. Okay, really following up on Senator Johnston's point. Um, I agree, certainly, that we still have a ways to go to really learn the lessons of this accident. But it seems pretty obvious to me that one of those lessons is you need to reduce the inventory in your spent fuel pools if you can. That seems to me to be a very sensible thing to look at up front, particularly for things like if for BWR designs where your spent fuel pools are above grade. Um, now, I, so I'm inviting anyone to take, take issue with me on this. Is this the kind of thing 
that we can expect to see some action out of regulators on. My recollection is that post 9-11, there was discussion of requiring everybody to move older fuel out into dry cast. The industry fought it as needlessly expensive. Uh, are we going to see some change now? Okay. Alex, whoops. Um, as I said, and I think this conversation is going to reflect this, there has been an evolution of the discussion about Fukushima to, uh, an ev to a discussion about the U.S. used fuel program, which has several infirmities. Uh, without a question, it would be nice to see those issues resolved. What we'd like to see is a, a system for dealing with used fuel agreed upon. It would make it a lot easier to understand how individual parts of that system should work if the government could settle upon a workable system. Invariably, there is going to be pool storage. Used fuel fresh out of reactors has to be stored in pools for some period of time. That's the hottest fuel. Uh, invariably, used fuel will be moved out of those spent nuclear fuel pools into some sort of casks, whether it's a storage cask uh, of one design or another, whether it's a transportation cask, has yet to be determined. Ideally, but not invariably, it will be moved to some sort of centralized storage facility, a monitored retrievable storage facility of some sort. It is quite possible that there will be some sort of processing of used fuel in the future, and eventually you have to have a geologic repository. What we would like to see is certainty as to what that program is. We can store used fuel safely in pools. We can store it safely in casks on site. The standards are for protection of human health and the environment are similar for the pools and for the casks. From the NRC's perspective, and Chairman Yatsko was asked this at the Senate Energy and Water Appropriations Committee, both are safe. The issue is how do you assure the safety of used fuel storage in either pools or in casks? And you've got to meet those standards, and, and we do currently. We don't want to be moving used fuel numerous times unnecessarily. You don't want to be moving it into one type of cask, out of a cask, back into a, into a pool, into a transportation cask, et cetera. If we could get some clarity on what the program would be over the long run, then we could begin to move to implement that program. Now, we think that the Blue Ribbon Commission is the most valuable or the, the most likely organization to put forward some proposals that will engage in this sort of national dialogue that has to happen, particularly in the Congress. In some ways, it may be that the Fukushima incident encourages the Congress to take the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission seriously. I have worried for some time that there's nothing that compels the Congress to reevaluate the Nuclear Waste Policy Act just because the Blue Ribbon Commission issues a report. Maybe the situation in Fukushima increases the likelihood that the Congress will engage constructively on this issue. Uh, there is no group more frustrated by the lack of clarity than industry on the used fuel program, but it's incumbent upon the government to decide if, they, if it's not going to follow the Nuclear Waste Policy Act exactly which program it is going to comply with. At that point, industry will begin implementing that program. Any other comments from the panel? All right. Hi, my name is Yong Su Hang, uh, working as a visiting scholar in CSIS. I'd like to replace the comment uh, by Sharon in scientific way because I used to be a scientist. Uh, I'd like to ask a question then to Alex. Uh, to me, the real problem and difficulty is how to define severe accident, which actually determine the core damage frequency. As far as I understand, there was uh, some difference between G people and the TEPCO people about how to define severe accident. And as you mentioned, the loss, loss, the loss of the up side uh, power and all other blackout and the anticipated uh, transient uh, behavior with the, with the screen, those things actually determines the core damage. And uh, do you see do you have any idea how you can actually redefine severe accident, including some future threat of the potential earthquake and uh, hurricanes in this area? For example, what if, do you have to consider hur uh, hurricane in category five in your new design, something like that? It will be, to me, very challenging how to get the scientific opinion as well as the public opinion 
to refine to do to redefine uh, what the CV accident you should consider for the license application. <coughs> so, how do you predict that kind of uh, things in this country? You can't predict all severe accidents. Okay. What you can do is you can have a design basis in which you forecast the, the credible events of any type that cur could occur. You design so that you can meet your design basis. And then particularly what we do is we go beyond that with severe accident analysis. What happens if something exceeds the design basis and results in a set of circumstances? And how do you respond to those circumstances? It is not simply a question of under, well, for, it, it's, a, it's an inappropriately simple answer, but I know an orthopedic surgeon who does not spend his time trying to understand how people can bear, break their legs. He spends his time trying to understand how to fix broken legs. So the issue, the, the analogy is, what we really have to understand is what can possibly happen at a plant and how do you address those scenarios? And we think we can do a good job of that regardless of what exterior event causes a situation within a plant. And if you want a longer answer, we can do it, but it'd take a long time. <laughs> okay, we have one question over here, and then tomorrow, the, can you pass the microphone to this person in the back? I think. Into the <laughs> Hi, Stephanie Cook. Um, I want to follow on from what Margaret said. Um, Bob Alvarez and I, I have two, two phases to my question, so if you bear with me. One is on spent fuel pools that um, Bob Alvarez and others have been beating the drum about just um, backup power to offsite, uh, to spent fuel pools. And it seems to me that even you know, uh, it's true what Margaret says, that something has to be done about these compacted, densely packed uh, spent fuel pools. But at the very least, it would seem to me that something might be done about just ensuring that there's emergency backup power for, you know, some period longer than we have right now. And I would like to get a comment on that. The second thing is, is that um, despite all the assurances from the authorities about our, and, uh, and President Obama about the safety of nuclear power plants, I want to raise the question that Ed Lyman raised yesterday about B5B and why it's um, secret. And um, if you think, A, it's justified that it's secret, if you could explain why it's justified, 